how can we now get the attitude of Huga? Once we understand the concept of the home of Huga, that's what we'll talk about today. You cannot buy the right atmosphere or a sense of togetherness. You cannot Huga if you're in a hurry or stressed out. And the art of creating intimacy cannot be bought by anything but time, interest, and engagement in the people around you. Mike Viking, The Little Book of Huga. I did a different podcast by a book of his, which I really enjoyed, about how to make memories and memories that stick and make our lives happier. That was episode 142 and 143 in the Starts With Small Steps podcast. So if you're interested in some of his writing, I think he's really interesting and I enjoyed his work quite a bit. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about Holy Huga, Creating a Place for People to Gather and the Gospel to Grow by Jamie Erickson. So last week, we talked about how we can create this quiet place a place for ourselves to get away and have quiet and reflection. Also, maybe a place where we could invite other people and have hospitality so other people can enjoy our home, listen to faith, maybe even be discipled by it. But this week, we're going to talk a little bit more about the attitude of Puga and how we can do better to not just have it in our lives, but to share it with other people. She said that oftentimes Jesus went off to a solitary place and people would always follow him along. That is such a magnet for people. Like I said about the olive garden that he stole himself away to so he could get time to pray. He was always caring about himself, taking time to pray, getting time to rest, but he also had time for other people, healing people, caring for people, talking to them. And so she thinks we can take that attitude on about being in God's word, you know, getting to know the word of God better. And it can help us because that's the idea is, first of all, I think the Bible is our plumb line. It shows us the straight up and down of where we should go. But I think, too, it's supposed to be a rescue to us, a help to us. It's a, it's a love letter from the creator. It's telling us how to live and the best ways to go and places where other people kind of screwed up and how we could learn from those lessons. And she hopes that the word of God transforms us from the inside out, she says. And that we should limit the voices we hear. I think apart from just having a quiet house where we could get some peace in mind and we're not distracted by our phones and everything else all the time, maybe we also make a bigger try at shutting down voices that harm us. Or, you know, if the news upsets us, we don't watch the news on those days. It's not like by knowing the news, you can affect change in a direct way. When you see there's war or there's disease or there's suffering, we can pray for that. But that doesn't mean you have to drown yourself in news. So I think protecting yourself from events or maybe people who are harming you. She even gives kind of this interesting idea that we have to pick boundaries. And she said, if you're the kind of person who's being voluntold all the time, that it's time for you to remain silent. She says, you have the right to remain silent and allow God to take charge of our lives because in the end, he has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. And if we are sitting there and filling all our time with the plans of other people, Are we living out the plan that God has for us? Or are we just doing someone else's idea of plans? So taking charge of your lives and giving yourself that time to reflect will help you in so many ways. She said that her mother-in-law suggested that she needed a seasonal hobby. And she's right. People in the North Woods, if you don't live in the North Woods and the North areas, we have seasonal hobbies. And we have hobbies that are in the in-between seasons, too. If you were to look at my Todoist account, I have tasks to do this season and tasks to do the next season, which means there are things I work on in the summer. There are things that I work on in the fall. And there's projects I work on in the winter, knowing that I'm not going to get outside as much. I'm not going to go for hikes as much. That gives me a chance to catch up, do all the things that I need to do, straighten out my house. Right now, I told you I was going through a process of giving every room a purpose. And everything that's in that room fits that purpose. And then the rest, I put up shelves in my basement and it's going in the basement 
which has the purpose of storing all the stuff. So that's my winter project. I guess I didn't think of it that way. I have winter hobbies. I have winter projects. Knitting, also a project I like to do in winter. So she said that that's a good suggestion that she got. But she said, too, that when we can have hobbies for different seasons, it'll make all the seasons feel a little bit different. I don't tend to knit in the summer because it's kind of warm to be sitting under a big pile of wool yarn. I have other hobbies. I do other things. And she said that we can take those seasons and make them feel like something because we have different activities because of them. When you live up north and if you live where she lives in Minnesota, you don't have a lot of choice. You can't have the same hobbies. But still doesn't mean that if you live other places, you can't have seasonal change based on your activity, the types of food you enjoy. I mean, some things come in season when it comes to fruits and vegetables, and some things are out of season. So you can enjoy the seasons, make them special just by how you live your life in each season. I thought that was just such a wonderful way to look at it. She also says that we should give dignity to other people, kindness, that we should be the person who makes connections instead of fighting with each other, instead of blasting each other on social media and in person and hating each other. Can we instead bring people together and end this fighting with everybody? Instead of yelling at each other, can we bring each other together and give them hope, give ourselves hope? She says that before we start any battles on Facebook or Twitter, we should ask ourselves, quote, will this comment only serve to provide a point or will it help me build a relationship? Boy, how many people actually do that on any social media at all? Will my words bring honor to this person and the situation showing that I care or Will they fuel or smolder embers of social derision? So is it going to make us build and bring honor to each other or will it just break everything down? And I thought, wow, that's such a great standard. I loved it. And I love that she said it. So much bullying out there. And instead we have to go away from that, which means that we're going to have to, she says, figure out what our banners are. If we had a flag that we were waving around, what would that flag say? Is it a flag of hate? Is it a flag of, gosh, pushing each other around, of being horrible to each other? Or is our flag one of love, one of activities that bring people up? Boy, you know, I think if that's the thing, if you could think that when you're walking around an activity, if you imagined what kind of flag you're walking around with and telling other people who you are, what would that be? Maybe it would make us rethink how we walk around in this world if we thought our flag had love on it instead of our flag having vileness on it or violence on it or bad feelings. I think it can bring us into what she calls justice, love, mercy, and that we can walk humbly, which was Micah 6.8. She said, this is what we are required to do by God. She said that when God built his first home of Eden, he didn't make it overstimulating. He made it practical. He made it efficient. It all worked together. She said that God's goal in all of this was not just to be the bare minimum, but instead it was everything that we needed in terms of how we would act, in terms of the things that we would need, and that it had all the senses there, the sights, the smells, the sound. I love that. The whole idea that this was the perfect home for us. And we're going to see that perfect home again that's what God's plan is for us, this garden that he made for us. And so she said that he put everything in it. He didn't waste anything. And it was all for the good of all of us. And she said that the proper way to look at it is that a home will have the atmosphere of humility, an atmosphere of authenticity, of provision. We're going to give people what they need and a place for growth. Those are the things that God presented to us. And so we can present that in our home and in our places where we invite other people. And that it's not just about the aesthetic of Huga. It is about that concept of the heart of it, the, the holistic meaning of it. And she said that it isn't just about minimalism, but it is about less. Now, okay, 
my house, not sparse. I'm trying to get less stuff and I'm trying to do better with all the different things that are in the house. Less things, less things in every corner. Not only because I think it's probably healthier for us to have less things and I'm donating all the stuff to Goodwill and getting rid of it so that other people can use it. But I think when you have gaps in your home, that will give you a place to put the plant you got from your garden. That's going to give you a place to set your book down when you're done reading and your eyes are just not berated by something every minute. I don't live in a sparse home and I have a lot of high tech gear. My little hygge room, it's not sparse. She said that we would feel sparse when we were in a Danish home, but is to have that coziness that's there. I think we're going to have to figure out how we do it for our own ways and the atmosphere we want to have. But she does say that having more simple means, cleaner lines, she calls from and says that part of it's muted colors. I tend to like Northwood's colors the most, which are kind of muted, I guess. But I think in the end, people should feel whatever colors they want to have. I believe that the reason that these are supposed to be more neutral colors is the idea is that if you don't blast your senses out all the time with loud noises and loud colors and too much stuff going around, that you will have more bandwidth in your life to think about things and think about how you want to pray and how you want to plan your day. So it's a, it's, I think it's great. She mentions about how the garden too was, you know, simple and neutral and then simple colors, but you know what? Gardens are really bright and pretty and everything else too. So I don't know that that works. Gardens can be all sorts of things. So this atmosphere of Huga is going to allow us to enjoy the insides more. And I think that part of it she brings up is the fact that people who live in northern climates like Minnesota or the Danes, they spend a lot of times in their homes because we get winter. We don't have places to go outside as much when we live in these climates. And so making these places special, you know, it's our base camp for the whole winter. We're not going to leave very often and we're not going to spend time outside. So seeing candles, seeing that comfy room that we have is just going to bring that instant feeling to us. She says overall, the homes have a sense of order and not disorder, not sloppiness. They tend to be very well organized. So in some sense, when the people say that Huga is about having a privileged life, maybe not, because maybe you have more ability to have the Huga lifestyle when you didn't have the money to buy all the stuff. I know I lived more simply when I was poorer than I do right now. And so I think it's a perfect way that you can gather that, whether you're rich or poor, to have that simplicity. But she even talks about having bins of flowers or pine cones and just taking a simple walk can help us fill our rooms with things that give us peace. She says there's also an atmosphere of faith in our house. There's this concept of uh, Christian art. If we want to have Christian art that brings us love, it's not a way of being showy about our faith, but instead doing things that give us that peace. I have a plaque in my house that says, as for my household, we will serve the Lord. There's only me in my household, but I always want that message out there. My purpose is to serve the Lord, and I wanted that to be prominent in my house. So it's not just about having Christian art for the sake of Christian art, but it's a having Christian art so it supports our faith and brings us up when we're down or makes us stronger when we're not feeling so strong. But having the word around us in art will make us feel better. She says there's keepsakes around, things that give us warm emotional memories. That's a little bit about what that Mike Viking podcast I did on Start With Small Steps was about, creating those memories, memorabilia, things that bring us warmth, remind us of people. She says that those can be around the house. And so she says in the end, we're wondering how can we provide comfort when we're sitting in the discomfort of winter? She says she wrestles with that all the time when we're in our earthly living where things can be not so comfortable. How can we give ourselves that comfort so we can focus on what's important? She said that this will be a place for prayer, 
that God gave us this example to pray so that we can pray us, our, we. A lot of times prayers are meant to be communal and for other people. Maybe sometimes we do prayer so much with I and me. And I think it's a good reminder that our prayers should be what she calls unifying and bringing us closer to people. It's where we should praise God and thank him for the things that we have. She says that you don't have to be thankful for the bad things that happen. That's where it always gets hard. But you be thankful for the experience and even the pain of what you're suffering because that pain or that part where we're not really feeling great because something happened is what's going to bring us closer to God. And this is where that analogy that she brings up, people will talk about, about the pruning of the vine. As a gardener, I understand that pruning a vine is valuable, that it helps the plant grow better. It cuts off parts of the thing that is damaged, where it won't grow properly, where it won't see the sun properly, where it's getting too big and it's going to cause damage to the plant. Pruning to a gardener means I'm helping the plant. Pruning to the plant might not feel the same way. And so when God talks about him pruning us, it doesn't feel comfortable. We don't want to be trimmed away. We don't want to be cut back, even if it makes us closer to God. It makes our lives more focused on him. Ooh, it's a different viewpoint altogether, but we will not ripen properly if we're not pruned and cared for by the ultimate gardener, which is Jesus himself. So we know when you live up north, it's the cold. That causes plants to grow, have a new season, and have a better season next year. It gets rid of the bad things like the bugs so that they're not overrunning us. And so we need that process of winter so that we can have that successful summer. So while we don't like that idea, it's important for the fruit to have these types of things to make it grow better next year. She says that Satan always wields this one weapon, which was trying to change her perspective and using her short-sightedness to ignore what God has asked her to do. And so that is the weapon that has been causing death and causing sin. And she says, sin may have been the cause of her death that day, but it came by discontentment, a weapon Satan has been wielding on humanity ever since. So that discontentment we have is also causing us problems. So this is where the change of perspective comes in. It's not just about having a new room or having a new house or having a new decoration. It is also about becoming okay with what we have. We always think about it, and this is the weather thing I was thinking about when I was reading this book, that when it is 40 degrees and it's March, I'm outside riding my bike. I'm enjoying my, oh, it's 40 degrees. It's 50 degrees, and I'm cheering this on. But then when you get to 40 degrees in winter, you're like, oh man, 40 degrees. <laughs> it's a whole different perspective. It's the exact same temperature. But because we have comparison, well, it was warmer, now it's cold. And then in the spring, ooh, it was cold, but now it's warm. The same temperature can feel entirely different because our perspective has changed. So, in a sense, that's how we get into the mood of praise and thanksgiving and all the concepts of huga because we've changed our perspective of things and gone beyond just making a new decoration scheme. We want huga in our lives as a concept, not just as something we did to our house. So gaining that contentment is important. And Jesus, she says, was always content. He always had that air of calm, of dignity, no matter what situation he was in, and that we can get there too. She said the Danish people have figured out ways to get around discontentment, that they don't even feel like there is any such thing as bad weather. I've heard this phrase, like I said, living in an area that has a lot of Scandinavians. There's just bad clothing, which means the weather's fine. You just have to plan better. You can be comfortable anywhere if you have worn the right thing. And that's the same thing with attitude. There is no bad situation. I mean, there are bad situations, but then again, they are what we make of them. And so she said that this concept of puga life 
is going deeper than just thinking about the thermometer. It's about having contentment in every situation. She says she has difficulty with it because of the thermometer. I think it's exciting when it gets to minus 20 or 30 degrees, but I think she thinks that it's probably not as exciting as I do. So she's learning. She's getting there. But she said that we can get that sense of contentment when we get rid of envy. Envy is what causes us to want what other people have. It causes us to want to be richer than we are, to have more stuff than we want to. Comparing ourselves to other people is going to also cause discontentment. And so she says, quote, why settle for death when life is possible? Why do we pick on these things that don't give us everlasting life when we have everything we ever need in Jesus? And so that's when we can live in gratitude. We can be thankful for the bad weather. And she even thinks that herself, she can find some magicalness in snow, in winter time, in snowflakes falling, and she can get there too. I love that. She gave a quote from the book, The Year of Living Danishly. Quote, Danes stay happy in winter because it's so awful outside that coming home inspires an overwhelming rush of relief and gratitude at having survived the elements. I guess I feel that too. I get home and it was blustery outside and the snow is flying everywhere and now I'm tucked in. I'm under my blankie. I'm drinking hot cocoa. And so I get that feeling of joy too. When it's so nasty outside that you have, and this is where we are, very privileged to have a place to be warm. And again, this is where the concept of Sabbath comes in. She reminds us that Jesus practiced the Sabbath and he would go against it when people needed help or people needed food, but he was still an obedient son. And Sabbath is something I think is having its day again, where people stop doing the Sabbath. Even when they were Jewish, I was Jewish and I did not like the Sabbath one bit because I did not want to not do something. I didn't want to slow down. But I think more and more we're finding how important that is. So we want to have that peace and quiet and warmth, but it's not about shutting other people out. It's about inviting other people in. If you're Jewish, when you have a Sabbath, you have a meal together. Meals cooked before Sabbath so that you could enjoy the meal as Sabbath has sunset into the day. It's important that we can enjoy each other's company. And so Sabbath is not about locking ourselves in our home and not doing anything. It's about being with the people we love the most. And she said that maybe that's why the Hebrew day begins at sunset, because we know how important it is to rest at the beginning of what was the beginning of the day. So having that rest right away, first thing, is important. She says in the end that hurry has become the tool of the enemy because it makes us feel like how hard we work, how much we work. You know, I worked 5,000 hours last week. We boast about it is considered to be a badge of honor. and It shouldn't be. There is more to our lives than work. There's more to our lives than being busy. We have been given a purpose by God We have to live our life with that purpose. And so in having some healthy balance that allows some downtime, time to take care of ourselves, time to take care of other people, and times to bring people together is what we're looking to do. She said that the Danes don't look at this as being privilege. They see it as not a careless use of time, she says, but instead it's supposed to be a rest a Sabbath that the whole world really needs. So I liked that whole concept. At the end of the book, she gives some really great ideas about ways that you can also do huga throughout your entire life by creating a neighborhood or a place to be, making what she calls blessing bags for other people. Just such a nice concept. And I loved the idea of it just as we're in our November, where we're in the time it's getting cold and the time to be outside is coming to an end for a little bit. And so now comes the winter hobbies and our time to be inside. It's always been my goal and I'm starting to get there. And having my friend over to my house today is a step in the right direction. Someday I want to be the place where college students, I go to a college church, could come and study at my house, have a Bible study. I could make a meal for them, something like that. I wanted my house to be a place 
where people would come. And I think that I'm starting to get there. So this book gave me a lot of inspiration about how I can make my house a place for Huga. So my challenge to you is try to think of what kind of banner are you carrying or what kind of banner is your house carrying? Is it a lifestyle richness of welcomeness, of isolation, or get off my lawn? Or is it a place of warmth, welcoming, and community? Think about that a little bit, about what kind of banners would be flying outside of you and flying outside of your house. See what you might want them to be instead of what they are. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Have a wonderful week. I hope you enjoy all the autumn coming to a close and as we're getting ready for winter. And please remember to subscribe to the podcast. Let me know if there's anything I can pray for you. And my email address is jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Please keep me in your prayers and I'm keeping you in my prayers. And just remember, offering an open door to community with other people starts with small steps.